Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you all have had a wonderful morning and enjoyed all of the conversation yesterday. Those of you that were here yesterday, and for those of you that were not, uh, we have uh, some very engaging uh, concurrent panels uh, today, and we're glad to see so many uh, young people here as well. And, uh, some young high schoolers here. Uh, Welcome. Welcome to this conversation about arts and culture. This morning, I uh, would like to uh, introduce you to two chefs that are here. Uh, I think Nalak uh, is really beginning to look at uh, the culinary arts and including them uh, in, in the disciplines that we support. And we're very fortunate to have uh, a wonderful board member, Adan Medrano, chef himself, uh, on our board and really helping uh, inform how we think about uh, the culinary arts and what uh, what the contributions uh, and the support that NALAC needs to provide to this field. Uh, so we want to start uh, this morning with a, a cooking demonstration. Uh, we are really going to look uh, at cooking as an aesthetic pr uh, practice. And I would like to uh, introduce our, our chefs this morning want to introduce uh, Adan Medrano. Adan is from uh, Houston, Texas, but originally from here, from San Antonio. And Adan actually uh, was the founder of the Cine Festival here at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center many years ago. Uh, so thank you for that work. Uh, so Adan uh, is a chef and a food writer who recognizes the importance of food um, in relation to identity and community. He is a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America and has worked professionally in restaurant kitchens internationally. He has a recent book, Truly Texas Mexican, A Native Culinary Heritage and Recipes, that was published by Texas Tech University and received the finalist uh, Book of the Year Award from the Forward Reviews. Uh, Dadan is also an award-winning filmmaker, and like I said, founder of the Cine Festival here in San Antonio. Welcome, Adan. And I would also like to recognize uh, Kevin Babbitt, Chef Kevin Babbitt, who is here. Uh, he works in the fine dining arena here in San Antonio, and he is also a graduate of the Culinary Institute of, of the Americas. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good, morning. good morning. If you'd like to, um, when I start working with the nopales and the chiles, if you'd like to move closer and take a look, I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll show it to you. So feel free to move around. Uh, my uh, presentation today is titled Cooking as an Aesthetic Practice. Cooking is an Aesthetic Practice. And um, I would like to uh, explore the question of how food is art. And uh, the cooking demonstration that I'm going to do is from the book that, I, uh, that Maria mentioned. It's called Truly Texas Mexican, A Native Culinary, Culinary Heritage and, Reci and Recipes. Because I felt that recipes really say who we are. They ground us to ourselves, to our families, and to our ancestors, the recipes that are handed down. So that is our heritage. This is a new type of book. The, um, book is, is a combination. It's a history book and a cookbook. It's a peer-reviewed book in history, archaeology, and food anthropology. So in addition to having history about the Native Americans of Texas uh, dating back to 10,000 years ago, my ancestors and the ancestors of most of the Mexican-American community here in uh, Texas, in addition to that type of history, it has 100 kitchen tested recipes which I tested in my kitchen which I think are delicious. <laughs> You'll be the judge of that. You're going to taste some gordita, okay? I hear a yes back there. <laughs> the, um, the book was written, it's a very personal book and so this morning I'm going to, the story that I want to share with you is a very personal story. This is, this is my, my food that I grew up with and I say that even though uh, Kevin, Kevin and I are good friends, we we are both graduates of the Culinary Institute of America, which is a fine dining preparation school. Still, my culinary compass is my mother's kitchen. 
la cocina de mi mamá is, is, is where I, found my, I find my grounding. So the book has, has uh, three sources of knowledge. The first uh, source of knowledge is written history. So as I said, it's a peer-reviewed book, so there's history about our ancestors 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, how they cooked, and how the recipes were handed down. It's also archaeology, because most of the knowledge that we have about, about our cooking here in Texas comes from archaeology, because uh, in 1528, when the Europeans arrived, uh, we had an oral culture, which is very rich because it gives you context, it gives you relationships, but we died off so fast with diseases and other uh, reasons that we lost so much. But archaeology, especially Texas A&M and the University of Texas, have been really strong in being able to unearth knowledge. And the third is oral history from my mother, my sisters, my brothers, my aunts, my uncles, my father, these stories that I know are true because they were told to me and you can sense that they are true. This is an important knowledge that although not written is still very important to me and that's how I wrote the book. The question we're going to uh, discover today and please ask me any questions along the way. Uh, food is survival, we know that. But in what sense can we say that food is art? And the questions that I'd like to explore this morning or discuss with you are in what way does food really affect our identity, both personally and as a community? In what way does food fix our memory, contain our memory, and enrich us with memory so that we may move forward? And in what way does food call us to question our choices and our patterns and make those ethical choices? So these are the three types of functions that one finds in any type of art discipline. So we'd like, I'd like to explore these this morning. But finally, we're going to eat it because <laughs> you can talk about food, but it's really about eating it, right? So we're going to eat. What I'd like to do before I start with the demonstration, which will be about masa for gorditas, chiles, how to work with dried chiles of various kinds, to develop flavor and aroma. And thirdly, how to cook with nopales. And uh, a couple of the students here were saying they've never cleaned a nopal, so I may call you up here <laughs> if, you're not, if you're not too bothered by that, oh, or not. And before I do that, let me just show you uh, the map about the, of the food that we will, we will eat today. Take a closer look. Could you lower the lights a little bit? So I, Can you see all right? Yes. You can see, okay. okay. This is the map of the Mexican Republic of 1824. So you see here is Coahuila, Texas, here is San Antonio. This was part of Mexico. And the food that we're going to talk about is from this region. This is biologically, culturally, historically a cohesive region. It's called, I call it the Texas-Mexican region. This is, the food today is not Tex-Mex. You see down there uh, behind the, uh, <laughs> behind this little, don't you like, this is like midnight theater, right? With the, the little, so this, this is Oaxaca Mexican cuisine. I'm gonna start making little, uh, there is not one Mexican cuisine, you know. There are many Mexican cuisines depending on the land, the sea, the practices of, of, of those uh, culinary uh, artists. So we have down here Oaxaca Mexican, which is known for mole. You have uh, Jalisco Mexican, so Jalisco is birria, pozole. And you have Sinaloa Mexican, chilorio. And you have Texas Mexican. Texas Mexican is another region of the larger Hispanic, I mean uh, Mexican, culinary history and practice. And you would say, but it, it's like south of the border. It has chiles, it has chocolate, it has you know, stuff like that. And uh, I uh, would say that although we are tempted to say it is south of the border, the, the river that we see here became a border, but before it did, the food was here and the food was here. So it was 
north of the border before the river was a border. The reason that it resembles Oaxaca and others in terms of some of the styles is that um, uh, before 1528, which is when the Europeans arrived, uh, we had communication with Mesoamerica. So we exchanged recipes, and when Cabeza de Vaca, who was, was the Spaniard who first landed here, he landed with three of his, uh, three of his Spaniard friends and one uh, African, African black, who became, actually, who became the most traveled non-native explorer, but he's sort of lost in history. But I digress. You see this uh, trail, that, that is the trail that Cabeza de Vaca took after three years of being in Galveston to go back to the seat of power, which was uh, Mexico City. And he knew how to take this because of the natives. He just asked. These were pre-existing routes of navigation and of trade among us. So that's why there is some similarity. Oaxaca resembles uh, Puebla, resembles because we, we did exchange recipes and ingredients, but each is distinctive. I just want to say that uh, there are three basic regions, and then, uh, then we're going to do the chiles. This is the central region of Texas Mexican cuisine, and this is the name of the many peoples who lived here and who have disappeared. Not entirely because I'm here. We are their descendants. The second region is the, the coastal region. I chose uh, the dish today because of the, of the Gulf shrimp, so we'll taste that. Everything we cook today is indigenous ingredients. And these are the names of the peoples who lived here, ate here, and from whom we get our culinary techniques. And finally, the, you know, Harlingen, Monterrey, Saltillo, this is also part of our region. And it's called the Coahuilteco region, and uh, these are the names of the people who have disappeared. But you know, we may have uh, lost our land and our language, but we're still cooking, and deliciously so. It, when we cook, and when I demonstrate this, we will be talking about identity because it is an art form and community in the Americas. That's important. So you see up here, that's where we are. But when we cook, somos Latinos. So there are many Latinidades, you know, Venezuela, Colombia, Brazil, many Latinidades. But the point of our cooking and the point of dealing with natural material culture is that it grounds us in this hemisphere. So we are, you know, Americanos, Latinos. And that's one of the uh, ideas I'd like to, for us to discuss. I'm going to share you my food, which is here in Texas, but it's the same for all people who cook, who cook in this way. That looks like gordita time, so let's do that. The first thing about gorditas is uh, that you have to make sure that you're putting an emphasis on the masa. Many people think the masa is just, is just, oh, I'm gonna put salt in first. I'm gonna use my hands, maybe not. <laughs> we were taught safety first. You're not actually going to eat this, but in case anyone is taking pictures, <laughs> I'm going to use gloves. Actually, that will make it better because then I don't have to wash my hands. La masa, uh, corn was invented by a woman uh, about 7,000 years ago. I'm going to make masa using maseca, you know, the corn flour. I say it was invented by a woman. I had a little bit of water, salt. I say it was invented by a woman because although we don't have a written record, we know from archaeology that women were the ones who controlled the gardening and the production of uh, agricultural products. So they, they were the ones who understood this. Corn is a man-made, woman-made product that uh, comes from a grass called teosinte. Teosinte was not corn. This lady, this culinary cook, she took that, did a hybrid, and created corn. Corn does not exist in the wild. It is a woman-made product. And then about, you see, you see how long, how a lot of water? I'm going to show you after I finish uh, mixing it how it should feel when you, when you finish it. And it should feel very, very soft because you need to let it sit for 20 minutes so that the corn, which has been dried, can rehydrate. And you'll know when it rehydrates because you, see, you, you sense the aroma. 
Me falta más agua. Okay. And then about 2,000 years ago, it wasn't the same lady, of course, but again, a woman, realized that corn is not nutritious. The protein is not very digestible. It has no, no niacin. And so she created nistamalization, which is you take the corn kernel, you boil it with uh, cal. You know cal? Um, it's uh, calcium chloride. And it changes the molecular structure of the corn. The molecule is different. The protein is, is very digestible, and the new molecule has niacin. And so niacin is necessary for the survival of any human being because it, uh, here I'm gonna, let me taste it because it, uh, here is the way you taste in a restaurant. You take, what I just did, you, you don't do. Think like this. Okay. That way your saliva doesn't go back in there. But anyway, levanta sal. So you do. And so that's called nistamalization. And uh, you can eat a tortilla. All tortillas that are sold are nistamalized corn. It's a different product. It's not the same. If you eat corn just off the stuff, it won't give you the nutrition that you get if you eat a tortilla because it's been nistamalized. Okay, we're going to send some of this your way. I'm going to do this properly. Mm. I'm sorry. It needs more salt. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to put a little bit of oil. Echale. Yeah, gracias. I don't normally put oil in gorditas um, because they taste delicious without, but for these, uh, Chef Kevin is, is putting them on a griddle so that the exterior is very, very crispy. It gives you a nice texture between the exterior crispiness and the interior very, very smooth and moist. So that's why I put a little bit of oil, well, that's a lot of oil, but into the, into the mixture, and I think the salt is just right. I'm going to pass these around and explain to you how cuisine, if it is divorced from culture, has no legs. When the Europeans arrived in, uh, in Mexico and in Texas, they uh, started shipping corn all over uh, Europe, Spain, Italy. Italy, you know, polenta is corn. And uh, it grew so easily and so well that it became a, 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 a substitute crop for, for wheat and others. And what happened was widespread nutrition. It was a huge problem because they took, they took the product without the people. They took the product and they didn't take any cooks, they didn't take any recipes, they didn't pay attention to the culture. The culture says two things, how you grow it and how you cook it. You grow it together with beans so that the beans put back the nitrogen that the corn takes out of the soil. And then you cook it with calcium hydroxide, con cal, so that it becomes a really nutritious product. And so because you failed to be grounded in the cultural context of the cuisine of the product, it caused uh, malnutrition. I would say that it, you know, it also caused other problems, which mean like it's more delicious, it has a better aroma, and uh, it mixes better. So there, aesthetically, there are some nice things that, that they lost. So this is the masa that we use for the gorditas. When you finish doing this, you cover it with a damp cloth which you will imagine we have here. So that's the first step in making the gorditas. That's gonna sit for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we are going to uh, stuff them, uh, grill them and stuff them. The second thing we wanna do is how do you cook with cheese? Everyone here uh, knows about chiles? Who's cooked with chiles? Okay, great, all right. Where are my chiles? You, you, you have the chiles. We're going to pass around now samples of two chiles, and they're dried. One is a chile, chile ancho, and the second one is a guajillo chile. Yes? Uh, they dry them in the sun. You can also dry them with a dehydrator if you wish. And uh, 
if you if you taste the difference between a dry chili and a fresh chili, you will see that it's richer. It's like when you have a sun-dried tomato, how it's so much you know richer in taste and flavor. Is it passing around? No. Now, um, do we have one that is not deceited? Okay. I'm going to ask you to give me one of those so I can show. He doesn't want to stand up. When you get it, look at it. Look at it on the on the light. And you see the color. I tell my when you when you first work with the chile, it has seeds in it. You make a slit. You open it up and you take all the seeds out. You take all of the veins out because that's where the capsaicin is. As look at the tepica. You don't want that. You don't want the heat. You want the flavor and you want the aroma. So when I tell the students at the CIA when I, when I do classes there, if when you have a restaurant and a man or a vendor or a woman comes to you to be your chile vendor and says, this chile is a number five on the Schofield scale or this is hot, if they talk to you about heat, fire them. Get another vendor because they need to be talking to you about flavor, aroma, texture, because it's the combination of these flavors that really makes your sauces. And there's, there are wonderful ways to work with it. The sauce you're going to the sauce you're going to eat today is made with equal parts of guajillo and chile ancho. After you clean them the way that you saw and they've been uh, deveined, boil them for about 20 minutes, 15 minutes, you let them sit, and then you, you're going to, they look like this, you know, you all can see. You're rehydrating them. There's two steps to this process. This can be delicious, and, and I urge you to, to try it. Here we go, and for this particular recipe, I'm going to use a very, very uh, traditional blending of spices and chiles. So the spices are naco, And then uh, comino, a little bit of comino. And I put some water because it'll help with the blender. I'm going to go pretty fast on here so that you can taste these. Do you think I can turn this on? Yes. Okay, great. If I do this right, if I do this right, it will not go all over the place. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, do you think you can cook it? Here is how you... You have to go really high and a long time. Why? Because you don't want grit in your mouth. It has to be silky, silky smooth. And if you, still, if you have little particles, take a cheesecloth or take a very fine mesh sieve and y los colas, you know. So that, because the, when you feel it, it's gotta be very, very delicate, very velvety, a lush feel in your mouth. After you do that, then you have to do the second step, which is you fry it. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> And you put a little bit of oil, you heat it, a little bit of oil, and uh, when you pour it in, it, 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 it'll splash a lot of times, so be careful. And then uh, when you cook it, just keep looking. If, you, if it's your first time, the color will deepen. You'll get aroma, the color will deepen, 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 and all the rough edges of the chiles will disappear, and you get a lovely, lovely sauce, which is what we're doing now. While this cooks, I would like to talk about the molcajete. You know molcajete, right? Mm -hmm. So molcajete is uh, Mexican and Mexican-American. It's not Venezolano, it's not uh, Colombiano, but we have similar techniques of... Uh, ah. See how it's boiling? I wish that... Um, I, actually, I may walk down there and show it to you when it gets ready. This never leaves your family. This belonged to my mother, when I pass away, it'll, 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 it'll be with my niece or my nephew. You never get rid of a molcajete. And I'm going to do it here so that you can... 
the Molca gente is volcanic rock from Mesoamerica. It's, they're all handmade, every single one of them. And it arrived here around the oh, 16th century. Most of the molcajetes that we use here in Texas, Native Americans, were granite, because granite is, is the stone we have here. But we adopted this. And it was used every day in my mother's kitchen. And I'm going to pass this around so you can, you, you can sense it. And when you sense it, I want to know, lift your hand, and see if there is any memory. But before I do that, I would like to say also that this is the metaphor for our community and for our food. You know, a crucible, molcajete, where various disparate elements, tengo ajo, black pepper, and comino, but they're all coming together and creating harmonious flavor. This is how you cook, and this is, this is really a metaphor for our community. Colombianos, Venezolanos, Germans, how we create unity and a table for all. And lastly, when you do the grating, the grinding in here, you will have a very, very fine powder. So this is the great-grandmother of this. <laughs> Would you pass this around? Just randomly, and if you smell it and it reminds you of anything, let me know. As you go in, if, if, you, if you want to uh, scrape it some more, you certainly can. I'm just going to say a few more ideas about this cooking. When I cook here, I'm very, very aware that I did not invent any of these things. Cooking with chiles, blending, everything I have received from previous cooks. And I'd like to go over some of the techniques that I find really helpful. This is Enchanted Rock, Texas. And the rock back here that you see is actually a very large five-part molcajete. This, these indentations that you see, they would sit around together and, and make purees and prepare, prepare the dishes. And you can see it's granite. This is thousands of years old. So every technique we use today, even in fine dining restaurants, our great ancestors, culinary artists, invented them in order to make delicious food. Stone cooking in earth ovens is, uh, is the precursor of our 350 degree oven, 250 degree oven. In almost dead here in San Antonio, if you get a chance to go there, uh, there is an earth oven that dates 4,000 to 4,500 years ago. And it's there, and my father, when I was a little boy, about eight miles from there, we lived on the west side, he dug an earth oven, cabeza de pozo, barbacoa de pozo. So these traditions are in our memory, but the technique we owe to culinary artists beforehand. An earth oven is not, is not a very <coughs> recent phenomenon, because to do these functions, you have to understand which rocks hold the heat for how long they will hold them and so forth. Stone boiling, where you have stew, calditos, and guisados, they would take the rocks and heat them up and put them into the bowl and then you'd have beautiful, beautiful uh, stew. Oyster, this is a uh, midden that was found in uh, near Corpus Christi. Lots of oysters, so we used to eat oysters on a half shell. We used to steam them as well. And uh, now we go to the, to the cactus that will show us that when we deal with cooking, we're dealing with material culture. Material culture is not just survival. It's how we choose to survive on the planet. It connects us to each other and to the earth. And that's, what, that's when it is at its best as a form. Are there, before I start cooking the cheetah, do you have any questions? Yes. And 
also the blender has really digested. I mean, the, the blender has made it into a puree, so that, yes. And that's why, you, that's why I said when you, when you finish it, you don't want little specks for that reason. Yeah. I think it's true in the sense that other ingredients have been on there and you never wash it with soap. Uh-huh. So it does, it does give it a, an earthiness that's very, I think it's very minor in, in the grander scheme of things, but, but it does, yeah. Something I didn't know, so the molcajete, the, vol- the molcajete made of um, volcanic rock was brought here in the 16th century, so that wasn't something that was indigenous? Correct. Oh, okay. I don't know. Uh, what was indigenous to tech to us is is the use of a molcajete, but it was made out of granite okay. because so that was so the rock. Those indigenous they used uh, ones out of granite, and then the other our ancestors, yes. And then well, the other thing, um, a lot of the new ones that they make um, seem pretty cheap. Have you looked at the new ones, or or they seem to break? Is that just a different? <laughs> okay, if what you, you buy. I mean, that's why it is important, like you said, to keep it's the ones very, that you still have. Yes, it's, please. I don't know how to say this except, except to be very blunt. Say, si compras uno de esos baratos made out of plastic, well, you will go to culinary hell. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other way to say it, you know. Don't do it. It's, uh, it's a beautiful thing because it encapsulates the art of it. Yeah, so... Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's worth looking, looking for them, really. And you'll get a better grind. You are now tasting the gorditas. I hope uh, we're passing them out now so that you can have a sense of where we're going. And the shrimp is, uh, has been bathed in this red chili that I'm going to show you. I'm going to move on to the nopalitos. This is how you, who's ever peeled a nopal? Oh, great. Okay, you can do it. No, I'll do it. First, you start with, with the sides. I uh, see, all around, all around, my mother used to use a newspaper to catch the. You know, sometimes I use, I use plastic, I mean, uh, rubber gloves because although my mother would never, ever use a rubber glove, uh, to do a demo, it's really better because if I am talking too much, I might get a, might get a piece of spine on my... Mira que bien están comiendo, so ha, any comments? Los de atrás dicen provecho. See, that's why you should sit up front. <laughs> and notice how there's no heat. Just a slight, slight tang. But so what I'm doing is the rest of the peeling. You do the sides, and then you'll notice that the skin, it, it, it bumps up. And so you can just, with a potato peeler, uh, peel it, and you will take the little bumps away. And that's where the, where the spines are. I learned this uh, from my mother. She used to do this with a knife, though. Is there another way that you've done it? Anyone else here? Just a knife. Mm. Well, my mom had would meticulously do each individual thing with a knife. But then at the HEB in Monterrey, I watched them because they have to do it really fast. And they would just take it, take a really sharp knife and go one way against it, and then turn it around and go against the other grain, and then cut the edges really fast. But that's how I do it. <laughs> that's a good way to do it too. Now, after, after you, of course, you have to throw the, the debris away and the nopalitos that, that we're eating. After you have eaten the nopal, then we're going to slice it into diced. Well, that's first. One. You need a sharp knife. Everyone loves a sharp knife. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show you what a finished chile should look like. So when you put it and cook it, I'm just going to go down here. I hope the streaming uh, viewers, hello to all of you. 
you won't be able to see this, but I'm just going to make a quick, quick tour. You see how there's a ribbon, una huella, a trail? See, it's got to go there because that's when you know that the flavors have been developed. You see the trail? There. It's about 15, 20 minutes, but it depends on how much water you put in because uh, if you put too much water, then it's going to take longer. But it's got to look like that. You see? It's got to do that. It's got to do a way up. Uh, I'm going to do this fast. See? A way up. When it, when it gets to that, that, that texture, then, then that smell great. Then, then you know that you've cooked it long enough and it's gone. Okay. Back. Did you see? There you go. And most of these techniques are taken for granted in many Tex-Mex restaurants because they, they think, you see la huella? Because they think it's, oh, I see the they, they think it's throwing together chiles to make them hot. Mm, I wish I could eat that. Esta la huella. And so what I hope that we can begin to understand and practice is that it is an art. It's got nuance, it's got technique, and you develop flavor with technique, not just with ingredients. We're just about finished. Good. We're just about finished with the tasting. I think everybody finished tasting. Okay, before I do the nopalitos, um, are there any questions about the taste in your mouth, any comments, any memories? No, no, I like hot spice, yes. But it isn't, it isn't a one-note cuisine. No. Mexican food, hot, no. I'm, it's not one note which is hot. Hot is part of it. It's very important. Yes, I made a mistake, but now I was six years old. I was used to guacamole. There was this molcajete with guacamole, pero le habían puesto chile, chile verde. So there was there was serrano in it, which I did not know. So I went and I, ah, this is my first taste of chile, and it was pain. And then I then I loved it. So so yes, we the heat is a necessary component of the overall flavor, but it is not a one note dish. You need to have the complex. Uh, blending of the chiles. So that's why we have so many chiles, and uh, each of them has a different flavor, a different you know, color. Now, here is how you do the, the nopalitos. Uh, 360 degrees or more, take a little bit of oil, and after you've diced them, I'm going to do this really fast, after you dice them, one, two, three, four, five, Oh, excuse me. There were some more questions. I'm sorry. You had. I had a question. Just uh, what, what's the difference between the ancho and the guajillo? Very good. Thank you. Uh, chile ancho is a, is a poblano chile that has been dried, and uh, it's used in, I would say, 80 percent of the, of the recipes because it's a base. It just gives you a very earthy, well balanced base of flavor. Base of flavor. The guajillo doesn't have so much flavor, doesn't have a lot of heat, but it has beautiful red color. So you add, you add the, the guajillo for color. It has a beautiful red color. Uh, you use it a lot of pozole. There's another one called pasilla, which tastes a little bit like a pasa, like a raisin. And there are many others, so. The, the trick to cooking Texas Mexican food is to Blend the chiles, the flavor, in you know, in different proportions, so that you get a really beautiful sauce, like the one that you had. Any other questions or comments about the gorditas? <laughs> they were too small and muy flaquitas. <laughs> Cook this for, I'd say, 17 minutes, just in a little bit of oil. You don't want them to get brown or to get color. Most people will say that they don't like este, no palitos porque you know, it's, they're slimy. They're not slimy if you cook, it, cook them this way. No palitos happen, happen to be a superfood, 
We've been eating this, these for thousands of years. High in antioxidant and uh, on the planet of all the food stuff that you can eat, this has the fewer calories and the most nutrients, which is, which is really strong. And it, uh, many of the old recipes will uh, use uh, cactus immersed in water and then drink the water because it's so good for your system. So after you do that, you throw in the onions and then the shrimp. After the onions have been uh, sauteed to the point where they're clear, you know, transparent, then you add that chili. It's very nice. Well, you've tasted it already. Okay. I hope that you end up making this, you know. Uh, the recipes in my book, if you can't buy the book, for, the book is available on Amazon.com and uh, Barnes & Noble. This is for the uh, video streaming. But if you can't, then go to my blog and I'll post it there so that you can have the recipe. This lovely sauce that you saw, aromatic, and you throw it in. Ah, que delicia. You're going to cook that a little bit so that about five minutes, ten minutes. What you want is for the chile, que se empape, que se empape el cactus. Yes? A question. Okay, so you're not boiling the nopales. You're frying them. The babas don't come out? The babas come out and then they dissipate. Cuando los estás, cuando se están friando, when they're frying? Yes, yes. I've never ever done them like that before. This is so new to me. So Great. I would, I would like boil, boil them, it was con sal y cebolla, right? And then los cuelas, and then you fry them, and then I would fry them. I don't know, I never done it. So no están duros, están suavecitos? No están bien suavecitos, well you ate them. Oh, pues así se hicieron, okay. Yeah. Wow. So the, that's the question that it normally, um, we're trained to boil them. I think that works well too. If you boil them, you can put them in a salad uh -huh. immediately thereafter. That's fine too. But this allows you to uh, add the onions so that it becomes translucent and very flavorful. And I'm going to just do this now because it really should have 10 more minutes. Cuando ya está 10 minutos, then you add some water because it'll dry out. See, this smells so nice. <laughs> You add the water, and then when it comes back to the boiling point, you add the shrimp. You have the shrimp cut out, you know, cut in little pieces. You know, I'm gonna have to taste one. I didn't get one, and I'm getting hungry with this. When it's really boiling, really, really hard, uh, fast, we throw the shrimp in, put the heat back up so that it becomes, it goes back to the boil. Then you time it, two and a half minutes. Uh, why? Yeah. If you if you if you if you if you overcook it, it will be rubbery when you bite into it. This way, if you if you saw it, it's nice and it has a nice bite and it's not rubbery and it also maintains the flavor. So that if you wait two and a half minutes, depending on the temperature of the shrimp, it might go three minutes, you know. But you can see, as soon as it turns pink and it's all white, then it's done. And when it is done, um, can I have the gordita, which is the sample? When it is done, then you take a nice plate to present to your guests. This is a great buffet you know, cocktail party dish for your next, for your next uh, entertaining event. I'm going to take three of those, and then I'm going to stuff them. Uh, the reason I want to show you how to stuff them is that you'll know when you're stuffing them whether your pieces are too big or too small. So beforehand, you just plan how big your gordita is so you know how small or how big you want the items to be. This looks great. Um, parenthetically, did anyone have any memories of the molcajete smell? What was it? It was in grandmother's kitchen. Your grandmother's kitchen. She was present. And I had that. Remember, you incarnate? Definitely growing up, I would always see the one growing 
grinding the, the garlic. So that memories of my cooking with my parents. Actually, I had a question about the world kind of day that I wanted to ask. I know in Puerto Rico we use uh, a wooden pestle and mortar. And you mentioned before they were with granite. Were there other materials that were common in that cuisine for the pestle and mortar? Well, yes, there are. If you go, if you go throughout the Latin Americas, there are different <coughs> Latinidades, you know. So yes, I don't know about the. Um, I think the metate goes goes all the way down to uh, the Mayan region, so, so parts of Central America. Beyond that, I, I haven't checked completely. Any other memories? But I. But that's my research question for my next book. Your grandmother. Was it the similar smell? Your grandmother. It was a similar. It was a similar. So this. <coughs> tamales. That combination of the three for the tamales, your mother. When you smelled it, was there a reaction in your body? No, no. My mom, uh, every morning when I was a kid, we were going to, getting ready to go to elementary school, and, and the sound of the little cajete grinding, real gentle. And I to wake up, and then it was all chipping, the, the, the rojos, all the time, from the salicita y naco, and just blend it in a little bit of water. And then uh, at the end, the uh, tomates that were roasted over the over the flame. So she would turn those roast them, and then let's chop them with that. And that was with homemade flour tortillas in the morning. All right, that's great. This, this is another technique. This is another. Uh, uh, we need that recipe. <laughs> this is another technique where you do the chiles and you roast them. Sometimes you roast them. Sometimes you don't. Depending on the flavor that you want. I'm very um, acutely aware of the time, so I'm going to assemble one for you. I'm going to, unless there's a pressing memory that you want to share while I'm doing this, please. Oh my goodness. So the memory is of, of, of your mother and other using a copper coin, a penny, to throw in the water, boil it so that the mucus would disappear. And then uh, another iteration of that is to boil them with, with onion. Uh, I, I think that's very interesting, as the others are interesting, because if we really were to spend time discussing these memories, we would see the strength of oral history. We would see the strength of our community that has been excluded from publication centers, from communication centers, but the art of cooking continues because it's handed on. So that's how the women 2,000 years ago invented nixtamalization by doing these things that they understood would be beneficial. So you take your, your beautiful plate. I have filled these <coughs> with the green and uh, lighter color nopalitos. And then after you do that, you take queso fresco, finely, 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 uh, powdered, and you open it, put a little bit inside, but it'll show on the outside as well. You're working with, you're working with visual as well as with taste. And after you finish that, then you take uh, cilantro, <coughs> chopped finely. If the gorditas are bigger, the cilantro can be bigger. You might even use leaves if you want more texture. And you put the cilantro, which goes on top of the white cheese, so you're really working with color as well as texture flavor and aroma. And there you are.
this is what you serve to your, to your guests. I would like to finish with a reading. We have five minutes. I would like to finish with a reading from the book to give you a flavor of the philosophy that's in the book. You know, that it, in addition to the cooking, there is a reason we cook, you know, it, and it binds us. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, read from the section that begins with cuisine as a strategy for community. How food played a key role in our ongoing identity is a fascinating part of our history. Having lost our land and language, along with economic and political standing, we continue to adapt, stepping into a new time and inventing strategies that would prove effective in the continuation and celebration of a people. Between 1492 and 1900, 90% of the native peoples of Texas died. The indigenous peoples who remained married with other tribes, with European settlers, and with Mexicans coming up from southern Mexico. They sometimes lived in Catholic Church missions and eventually came to be known as the Mexican people of Texas. It was a process of continuous change and adaptation. Anthropologists call this ability to survive cultural and ethnic shifts and form new, cohesive identities, ethnogenesis. Food was the cultural activity that held us together. Cooking nurtured our remembering, and through it, we invented new identities rooted in that remembering. Preparing food was that day-by-day regeneration. And the last paragraph from the book, in order to recognize the many, many cooks, both home cooks and restaurant cooks, who are doing this, and when they're doing it, they're putting us forward. They're advancing our community, they're advancing our art. Conscious of the horrors of, of our violent history, I think that ours must be an aesthetic, a culinary aesthetic, grounded in economic justice, the true context for peace. Most of us, the Mexican American working class, are still economically poor, the vestiges of our previous devastations. We have limited access to formal education and health care. We dream of a society better than the one from which we have come. From this position, many of us wish to be artful Chicano chefs. Hopefully, we will continue, and not just Chicanos. Kevin, other friends of mine, they are advancing this culinary art. Hopefully, we will continue to develop a loving finesse in our cooking techniques and appreciation of the humanity of all who come to our table. After all, our native culinary heritage prompts us to comfort, to heal, and to enjoy. That's the main thing. Thank you very much.